Okay, great. I think we're all set. So um, it's a great pleasure to introduce John Nathan Mattingly, uh, who uh, has made fundamental contributions to various areas, including SPDEs, MCMC methods, ergodicity of SDEs, Navier-Stokes, uh, the list goes on. So um, he got his PhD from Princeton University at, and from the Applied and Computational Mathematics in 1998. Then um, he spent four years at Stanford and as a member of the IAS in Princeton. And then he moved to Duke in 2003. He's currently the James B. Duke Professor of Mathematics and a Professor of Statistical Science. He just finished serving as an excellent department head for, for three years, five years, I forget, but it's over now. <laughs> Infinitely long. Yes. I don't and, even remember my life before. <laughs> and uh, he's been working very recently on um, trying to understand and quantify gerrymandering and its interaction um, with the geopolitical landscape. And so he's even uh, testified in, in court for that. So I think he's going to tell us a little bit about that. And for those who are not familiar with gerrymandering, because we don't have that term in India, um, he'll probably... Uh, tell us what it's all about and what the mathematics is beyond that. So thank you very much, John, and looking forward. The Over to you. Thanks, Kavita. Thank and I guess uh, thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me to come here. I mean, well, actually inviting me to talk. I, 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 I wish that I was there so I could uh, enjoy, make some new friends and uh, hear some new science in the hallways and also eat some wonderful Indian food. But so um, as Kavita said lately, I, I decided to take the, uh, the term applied, applied probability to heart and tell you maybe my most, my most applied down and dirty uh, work. So for those of you who are used to lots and lots and lots of theorems for me, that's not what you're gonna see this time. This is a very driven by the problem discussion, but I will get to some new Markov chain Monte Carlo methods we've been developing uh, driven by our application. Um, uh, is either that or talk about S singular SPDs, and I guess I decided to give this talk instead. So what I want to talk about is evaluating fairness and redistricting. And I think there's some general ideas here that could be used to think about fairness more broadly, but we've worked them out in an example, and so let me talk about that. So, um, oops, somehow, there we go. Um, so if you look in the news, if you live in the U.S. at least, you'll hear a lot, oops, sorry about that, you'll hear a lot about all different types of something called gerrymandering. And as Kavita said, I understand that this is an international community. So let me explain a little bit what that is, but it's of great interest in the US and it's particularly of great interest in the US because every 10 years um, we, so what happens is every 10 years, the US does a counting. It does a census, it counts all the people in the country and then it redistributes power in our legislative assemblies, both at the state level and at the, at the national level. So in Congress to each state, how many representatives they get based on that population counts. And then each state is responsible for subdividing itself into small districts who elect each of the representatives. So I live in the state of North Carolina. We currently have 13 representatives. We might get 14 when this new counting goes on. And we have to come up with ways to, re to distribute that. So let me explain a little bit what's going on. And, and it's also in the court. Uh, all of these are court documents, briefs written to the court or testimony presented to the court. A number of these actually are my testimony in the court. And what's interesting about all of these is they're all mathematicians. So uh, mathematics is having a real impact here in this conversation. All right, in particular, these are the core documents that my team has worked on. So let me, let me try to explain to you. So what is gerrymandering? So the idea of gerrymandering basically goes something like this. Somebody takes the state of North Carolina, which I'll show you in a moment, and they subdivide it into 13 districts and each of those districts elects representatives. And then at the end of the vote, somebody might get upset and say like, hey, you know, it looks like you've done something weird because my party, so the top graphic here, the blue party maybe, got 50% of the votes and the red party only got 48% of the votes. But yet when the seats were all done, which is the next bar I just added, the blue party only got four seats and the red party got nine seats. And you might say, that's not fair. Um, but, you know, you particularly would say that if you come from a system that's designed to produce proportional representation. And one of the themes of this talk is the idea that, first of all, the, the American system is not proportional representation, that you may just think that's crazy and maybe we should change that, but 
there's long-standing historical reasons, everything to do with philosophical reasons about uh, segmenting the power between the federal government and the state governments, but also realistic, you know, logistical reasons, right? In 1700s, when our country was founded, it took days to, to, to ride on horseback from one part of the country to the other. You couldn't just send a telegram or send an email with the results. So you actually needed some surrogate method. And that's what this, this system that was set up initially to do. Um, but, you know, this is somehow using some idea of fairness that you have in your mind. Like, I think it should be, have, be proportional representation, but the system doesn't say that. And so we have to really understand this mapping. And so I'll try to get to that. So also sometimes people look at different maps. So this is the state of North Carolina and the colored regions are the 13 districts. These are two districts that were used in the last 10 years in my state. And you might look at the one on the right and go, wow, that looks insane. Look at how, look at that red district. It's like going, you know, in a crazy pattern. It turns out that that's following an interstate and a railroad track so that there's high density people nearby that. So there's maybe a reason to have that red district, but maybe not. And uh, you might look at these two districts and say the one on the one, right, is just very ugly and we don't like it. So we're not going to use it. But what's interesting to discover is that here are three redistrictings now. The two that look alike are completely different. And the two that look very different that I have the equal mark between are very, very similar. And as every other speaker said, Kavita, I'm going to trust that you will interrupt me whenever there are questions. I'm happy to get them. Um, so here's an actual gerrymandering definition from a dictionary. It says to manipulate the district boundaries. So of these districts that are used to elect representatives to, manip to favor one party or another to change the outcomes of an election. And I've highlighted two sets of words here in red because they really talk about knowing what the answer was and then seeing that something has changed. And so we're gonna to try to use mathematics, statistics, computation to understand what might have happened and then to be able to identify what, when things deviate from that, okay? So the question this comes up with is what would have happened without political agenda? And these, the reason there's this dragon here is in the state that, that Kavita lives in, in Massachusetts, was the first historical example of gerrymandering probably in, Nor in North America, in the US at least. And it was in 1812. So this is an old conversation. And this was the political cartoon from the newspaper in the Boston Gazette. All right, so let me step back a little bit. There's a lot of talk about fairness and algorithms and fairness and in statistics and fairness, you know, with large data. And let me try to set this up a little more broadly. So we have a guide, set of guidelines, this yellow box, a set of procedural guidelines. And we have a, kind of a set of expectations or values. You know, and when I say values, I mean shared values that we might have. So Kavita just popped on. Does that mean she has a question? Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So there's a question about whether the districts have roughly the same population. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. That's, I'll just yeah. go ahead and answer the question now since you asked. Um, there are a whole different set of guidelines. So when I say set of procedures and guidelines, they are things like that. For instance, typically in North Carolina, in federal governments, they actually want the districts to have almost exactly the same guide, number of people, like actually within one person. So that's to try to preserve the idea of equal political power representing the same number of people. They might also say things like, we want you to have the boundaries of the districts relatively compact. They might say things like, you should not split cities if possible. You should not maybe split counties or you know, other administrative regions, uh, political regions, if possible. And so those are what I mean in this yellow box. So it's a perfect question, set of procedural guidelines. But then somehow we have this idea, like we want there to be fair elections. We don't want people of a particular race or particular economic standing to have a particular disadvantage in our political system. We don't want to design them to disadvantage a particular group or we don't want them to you know, make it so difficult because of geographical constraints that people have a hard time voting. So we have these set of values, but those are often not encoded in the, that yellow box. So what, this, so what we're gonna propose we do is, you, know, you might think that there's a link between them, but often in the law, there's not a link between them. So what instead, we're going to take this set of procedural outcomes, we're gonna observe outcomes and relationships, and then you know, see what, what those guidelines produce and then observe how they connect to our values. And then we're gonna critique what, what the outcomes 
that we that we see in real life are and say like did they match up with what we expected to see and if they didn't match up then you might think that somebody has an agenda that they haven't stated they may say like i was just doing what you told me to do in the yellow box but and that's the reason that this didn't turn out the way you wanted it that's the orange box but in fact you might be able to separate that and that's what i'll try to explain to you today in the example so enough abstract blah 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 here's the state of north carolina um and uh sorry i'm just trying to find my time there we go so here's the state of north carolina and um each of these little tiny boxes are our precincts so there's something like 3,000 precincts and um you see there's areas where they're very much denser if you can see my mouse i hope you can maybe you can kavita can you See that, I hope, yeah, there you go. Yes. These areas are where there are big cities. So there's lots of density. And so there's many more districts. And what we're gonna do is, this is where I'm calling you from right now in Durham, North Carolina. That's roughly where I live. And so what we wanna do is create districts. So here is this boundary to create 13 districts. These were the districts that were used in 2012, 2016. And so you might wanna think of this as some POX model. Right, each precinct, the fine scale is a vertex, and I have an edge that represents what things are next to each other. And I want to color this graph into chunks, into 13 colors with some very complicated non local energy that encodes the political desires and laws of my state. Now, here overlaid that is the actual political outcomes, political opinions. This is based on the votes in an election. And you see that you know blue is more Democrat, red is more Republican. You see that it's a very inhomogeneous state. There's a lot of diverging political opinions depending on geographic areas. And you know, and if you look at each of these districts, it elects a representative. So here in this election, there are actually three blue candidates elected, and the rest, the remaining nine, were red candidates. And what's now what I'm going to show you is well, what if I, you know, take the same set of votes. So here I'm going to take the same set of votes. I'm going to flip back and forth for you so you can see this change. Oops, sorry. Here's the same set of votes. And all I'm doing is changing the boundaries, OK? So this one was the one we actually used in 2016. And this is one that a political blog produced to try to be as favorable to one party as it possibly could. So we never changed a vote, but just by redrawing the lines, we now actually elect a majority of blue candidates. So that really shows the power of this redistricting question and how important it is. Because usually we think people go vote. Based on those votes, we have a political outcome. And it shows that by changing these boundaries, we can dramatically change the outcome of the race. Okay. So, you know, so we can ask ourselves so instead of asking, is a map fair? What we're going to ask instead is if we drew the map randomly would the map that you gave me that the politicians drew would it be typical would it have certain typical statistics that we care about okay so we're going to compare maps so here are three four maps the top two are actually used in races in north carolina actually the the one on the bottom left the 2021 was that just used in the last elections in november that was actually the maps that was that was made they were made to draw because the one in 2016 was deemed illegal in fact the map that was used in 2016 was drawn because the map in 2012 was deemed illegal and then the one in the bottom is a map drawn by some bipartisan group of judges who had retired who felt that gerrymandering was bad and they wanted to show what a group of from each party could get together and draw a map that was fair in their opinion Okay, so here are those four maps. And if you said, well, you know, how am I going to compare those maps? Well, I, what if I had a whole bunch of other maps? And maybe that's not enough for you. Here's a, a huge number of maps, not even that much, but we're going to. So the procedure I'm going to explain to you is the idea is we're going to draw a whole bunch of counterfactuals. We're going to make a whole bunch of an ensemble of maps, a collection of ulterior maps that satisfy all the rules all the procedures that have been lied out by the government. And then we're going to say, what would we typically see? What are the properties of that ensemble of maps? What are the received statistics that we would see typically? And then we're going to compare that 
to the map that the government drew. Okay, so let's go back to this abstract formulation. So the yellow box here is going to be the rules for drawing maps. They should have equally roughly the same number of people. They should have compact districts. They should try not to split counties and cities, divide them. And in the US, there's also rules about minority representation. So in fact, they should have some districts that allow the minority, the, dom the large minority population, so North Carolina, that means African-Americans, to have some chance of affecting the outcomes in at least the number of districts that roughly match their proportional, uh, their, their proportional part of the population, okay? And so now this bottom box right here, we're gonna, the outcome is we're gonna draw all this ensemble of maps and we're gonna see what statistics we would typically see from that. And we're gonna see that it doesn't completely line up with our set of expectations, but then we're gonna use that ensemble to critique what we actually see in real life. Okay, so now back to this ensemble. So here we are, I, I drew 24,000 maps using an algorithm. And we asked how many Democrats were elected. And when we elected those Democrats, we actually saw um, five or six were typically elected, okay? Yes, how was the ensemble generated? Fantastic question. That's the whole, that's the math part of the talk, it's coming, all right? So <clears throat> that was one of the questions in the chat, the least one I saw. So um, we typically fought, see five or seven. Now here is the map we used in 2016. And here is the map that the court forced them to make. So we could actually maybe make an argument that the map that they showed us in 2000, that we used in 2016 was unfair. All right. Here's two more elections. And once again, here I put a whole bunch of maps on. The orange and the purple maps were the maps that we actually used in our elections. And the yellow map was the map that the court forced us to use after it threw out the orange and the purple map. And if it helps you think if this is just a mathematical exercise, the, uh, this plot pretty much was a plot I actually showed in court, which was helped force the yellow map to be drawn. So I actually testified in this court case, in two court cases around this. All right. <clears throat> and uh, just to kind of, you know, I showed you two elections. Let me show you that these maps produce pretty regularly. So these are a set of different elections. This is the governor, the votes from the governor election, the president 2016, the president, uh, or the, House, the Senate. These are all just different American elections in my state. It's not really important, but they're just different sets of votes that are the expressed will of the people in our state. And you see that the maps that the government used in purple and in orange barely change at all, even when the kind of perceived the fraction, the, the, the vertical axis is the statewide vote fraction. So the bottom ones are much more Democrat, I mean, much more Republican, and the top one is much more Democrat. And so not surprisingly, this set of maps, this ensemble of maps represented by the blue histogram drifts to the right but the maps that the government showed us never changed. Okay, so, you know, one of the things if you do really, if you're really trying to, you know, there's this mathematics formulation, that's what I've talked about so far is turning public policy into mathematics. Then there's the question that, that came in the chat, which is how do we draw these maps? And then there's how do you explain this to a court? And I'll just show you this movie because I think this is a very interesting movie. So let me explain to you what's going to happen is if you look up here, this percentage here is going to shift 42% over time. And this blue histogram is going to move to the right slowly as this percentage increases. And what I want you to notice is the map that the state designed never barely changes for a very long time. So here we go. So you see the percentage, the vote fraction is increasing. So this is a sequence of sets of votes whose fraction is increasing. And the blue histogram shows what my ensemble of 24,000 maps is doing. It's slowly electing more and more Democrats, but it takes a very long time for the enacted map to catch up. And it's not until the Democrats have an overwhelming majority in the 50, 55%, which is a lot for my state. It's a very you know, mixed political opinion state. So, so one thing to notice right here already is, oops, sorry, let me go back is that, let me see, see if I can stop this again right here at the right point. One thing to notice 
is that we're coming up on 50% now. So I'm going to stop this just as we hit 50%. So there we hit 50%. You notice that it, half of 13 is more like seven. So this map really doesn't um, represent uh, doesn't represent proportional representation. And that's OK, because our system doesn't produce proportional representation. So what this allows us to do is separate these ideals that somebody might want to use to evaluate with the actual fact of our, of our system. So how are the new democratic votes distributed? We're, we're taking an actual election and we're using a procedure just to shift them up and down by the percentage. So it keeps the relative strength of different areas of how they vote. And, and there's some evidence that that's not such a bad model. All right, here's a different election. I'll show you, this is the last one I'm gonna show you. And then we'll start getting to the math. <clears throat> um, so this is for the House of Representatives in my state, our general, our uh, state legislature. And the reason these three lines here are, is this is when the override of the veto, the supermajority is split. So right now, most of the maps would give the, the, the Democrats not, the Republicans would not have a supermajority, but this enacted map is the one we actually used and you notice it significantly lags behind the purple histograms. And in fact, here at the very end, with 55% of the vote, the Democrats would typically have the majority. But with the map that we've been using for the last decade, the Republicans would maintain the majority. Okay. And it's basically been designed to protect this, to protect the supermajority and the majority. All right. All right, so uh, I'll show you, I, I lied. I'll show it one last time. Here, whoops, come back. Uh, let's see if this will uh, start. There we go. So th that map, the one that was in purple was the one I just showed you. It was overturned by a lawsuit I was part of and it was replaced by a map that was the yellow map. And now you'll see the new map is much better. Okay, so this is very applied statistics, very applied probability to be honest, because I think of statistics as the backwards problem. And here the hard problem is the forward problem in some ways. The backwards problem is just reading off some histograms. So we're just, but the forward problem is very complicated. Um, and you see that the yellow line is much more representative. It stays with the blue dots much more than the uh, purple line, okay? This was a slightly different election. So the, the result was slightly different, but it's the same. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm gonna skip this one. So what I'm going to talk now is now I'm finally getting to get to the question about how we built our ensemble of maps. All right, so <clears throat> the first step is we encode the law. Okay, we encode, sorry, we encode the law, that's one. Then we algorithmically draw the maps, generally using a Markov chain Monte Carlo, although now there's some work that people are developing to use sequential Monte Carlo. Um, and then we do some analysis and visualization. And all three of these parts are equally important, to be honest. Because <clears throat> if you don't explain it well to the judges, they don't really care what you're telling them. All right, so how are we going to encode the law into mathematics? Is we're going to come up with a score function, a planned score, which incorporates how well it respects all the facts of the law. And then we're going to build a Gibbs distribution. We're going to treat that like a likelihood, and we're going to exponentiate it. And then we're going to sample plans according to this probability distribution, OK? And our, our uh, score function will incorporate different things. It will have population, which we'll talk about how close the populations are to being balanced, how close they are to be compact, whether they split counties or cities, and whether they satisfy the voting rights up, okay? And you could have others. So for instance, here's an example of how we do the compactness score, is we look at the isoparametric constant. We look at the perimeter to square to area ratio, and we add that up over all the districts. Uh, Political science has independently uh, rediscovered this. They called the Polsby Popper score. Uh, I guess they didn't know that Dido already had this idea back in Carthage. Um, so, uh, right, so uh, here's the equal score. Uh, we just do an L2 distance. We experimented with L1 and some other things. It doesn't matter so much, but there's some good reasons to do L2. So we check what the population of the ith district, that's what C is, C is the ith district. We look at its population and we compare it to the ideal population, which is just the population of our state divided by the number of districts. All right, and then we also have some other score functions, which are, so in some sense, this is kind of a uh, optimization in a way, except we're not just gonna look for the best district. 
we're going to look for the range of ones that would be acceptable and see what their distribution looks like. All right. So uh, here's a cartoon that I stole from the IPAM website of a rough landscape. And that's a really interesting question. We don't really have a good Ising model yet for this. We don't have a model that would let us talk about phase transitions yet. We have some evidence and some examples. There's some nice papers that talk about computational complexity by, uh, by the group up in Boston around, uh, around Munduchin and, uh, and, and Justin and uh, Del DeFore and other people and some people in, Ma in Madison actually. But um, you know, we don't really have a good Ising model yet. But you know, what we're gonna use is Metropolis Hastings, which I've just, I'm getting, I see you Kavita, let me just finish the sentence. So uh, we're gonna use Metropolis Hastings, which I think most people in this room know, but let me just remind you, you take a step. If it's downhill, you accept it. If it's uphill, you accept it with some probability. And here's the classical Metropolis Hastings acceptance probability. And the only thing I wanna highlight before I let Kavita ask the question is that if you have an, the Q here is my proposal Markov chain. If my proposal Markov chain is not reversible, then I need both the forward probability, the probability to go from C to C prime, and the backwards probability to go from C prime to my current state. So I need both of those probabilities, and that will be important in a moment. Kavita. Yeah, there's a question from Sandeep about how are the weights alpha i's chosen? Uh, yes. So we have some historical history of what districts look like that have been accepted by legal challenges in the past. And so we tune those weights so that we seem to be sampling a part of phase space that looks like those maps. And those are nonpartisan criteria, things like how compact were we willing to call compact enough? How much population did, deviation did we have? How many counties did we split? How many, you know, what were the minority representation fractions in the districts that had the most minorities? Um, does that help answer? Okay, so we tune them using historical data would be the short answer. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so uh, if you then metropolize, it's a fact that when you use Metropolis Hastings, you end up with a Markov chain that satisfies detail balance. So you end up with, that's why the Metropolis Hastings algorithm produces the target, the target measure as its steady state, okay? Um, okay, so, <clears throat> so we encode the law. That's what I just talked about. Then we're gonna generate sample maths, maps. There are some methods that, that people use historically that don't really have a known distribution. So we're gonna tend to use Metropolis Hastings. So in the very beginning, I use single node flip like Ising-like moves. Uh, now we've moved, there's been a nice set of work that was originally donated by Munduchin and Daryl DeFore and Justin up in, in the Bay Area, I mean, in the Boston area. And they introduced some ideas using sampling, spanning tree methods, which I'll talk about. Um, we've now um, modified those to make them reversible. And they have their own version of that now. But we also have a multi-scale version of that, which I'll talk a little bit about. And then I'll just make some comments about um, non-reversible Metropolis Hastings also. And then I won't really talk that much about, but that's what these movies are about and trying to figure out how best to explain to a lay population who's smart, but not mathematicians, uh, how, how to make sense of this. And one thing that I really wanna be is, I guess maybe I'm a Duke faculty member at heart. So I kind of, I don't like just giving people a value. I don't like saying, here's a p-value, it's good, bad. You know, I like to say, here's a distribution of what could happen. And here's some things that might happen and you decide whether this is good or bad, right? So I try to give people tools to understand, okay? All right, so now, the first thing you might think of, and I'll be really quick about this because I don't want to dwell on it, is you might think to do an Ising move. So here is Iowa. This is actually the state of Iowa, and this is not so far off from their four districts. You might first find all the edges that are between two different colors. So all the edges that are conflicted, that have one between a, a vertex of one color and another. So they're the boundary edges. You then pick one uniformly, or maybe you do some tempering. Tempering helps, we explore that. So you do some tempering. You pick this and then you switch the, the, the color across. This works pretty well. And we've tried a lot of parallel tempering and other types of ideas, um, but it's not the best thing. It's a very local move and it's good for kind of locally relaxing, but it doesn't do the best, okay? And this is what we did at the very beginning when we started this work back in 2013. All right, more recently, uh, DeFore, Duchin, and Solomon, and their co-authors <clears throat> after that, had the following idea, which is a very nice idea. And it, it, it's, uh, 
it builds on, yeah, it builds on a number of things, but it's, it has, it's a nice idea in this context, it was new. And it said like, okay, what we'll do instead is we'll take two districts, the orange district and the green district, which we just pick maybe by tempering or maybe just uniformly at random. And then we merge those together. And then we draw, we, we draw a new spanning tree. So we draw some spanning tree on this, on this adjacency graph. Here's a spanning tree that I drew. And now once you have a spanning tree, trees are nice because they're linear objects. And so a simple search across this tree, you can find what edges you might, what possible edges you could cut it that would leave it relatively balanced. So you could recast what I'm talking about today is a computer science problem about finding relatively balanced partitions, okay? Not, not the most balanced, but within a threshold. So we're, that's a way a computer scientist might reframe this. So then you cut the red edge here and you end up with a new district, all right? So we're gonna take, we took this same, th that, was a, that was an algorithm from 2017. So a couple months later, we, we kind of built on their idea. We said like, you know what, we're gonna take their idea, but instead of evolving partitions, we're gonna evolve spanning trees. So we're gonna, instead of starting with a partition, so this was theirs, we had a partition here, which is just a subgraphs. We're gonna actually say, not only are we gonna tell you the subgraph, but we're gonna tell you a local spanning tree on each partition. So that's a spanning forest. And now when we merge them, we're gonna again, throw out these two spanning trees and make a new spanning tree and then cut it. But instead we're gonna move, move our state space to be the local spanning forest. Now that may just sound like stupidity, like it doesn't, I just changed nothing, but we're gonna see that's actually important for making this reversible. So let me first comment that this isn't that expensive in many ways. Well, it's got, some, it, it actually, it is a little too expensive, but it's, it, it made a huge jump forward. You can, uh, you pick adjacent, that's easy. You draw a spanning tree, that's not super expensive. There's Wilson's algorithm for doing that. And you have to count, the most expensive thing here is counting the number of spanning trees actually often. And that's a simple calculation with Kirchhoff's algorithm, but that involves taking a determinant of a matrix. So as the matrix gets big, it gets a bit expensive. And then you find the permissible counts. That's relatively cheap. Place these red vertices to cut. That's just a span, a walk, a search across the tree. That's not too expensive, okay? All right, so let me now explain why we switched from evolving on partitions to spanning forests. So, um, when we do that, we introduce a count, which is the total number of spanning trees on a certain partition. And we actually introduce the tempering parameter gamma so that we could move between, you know, assuming, let's just say if J was zero, so we got rid of this likelihood. Then when gamma equals one, we have uniform on, I'm gonna get it wrong. When gamma equals one, we have uniform on partitions. And when gamma equals zero, we have uniform on spanning force. <clears throat> um, and there's nice reasons to do that. And I won't really over talk about it because trees with uh, partitions with large amounts of spanning force tend to be more compact. So you may want to bias your way in that direction, but it's not as simple as that. It's not as just a direct relationship. But what I want to explain to you is why, why, why do we do this? Why do we like this? Um, the reason we like this is, um, I mean, let me just show you the next picture is because of what I said before. If you think about uh, on partitions, if you think about doing accept reject on partitions, you need to calculate this Q, the forward and the backwards probability. The forward probability is easy. The problem is the backwards probability is very expensive if you evolve on partitions. If you think about trees, it turns out the backwards probability is very easy. And I, I like to think of this as an example of data augmentation. Right? We do this a lot in, in statistics when we want to do some kind of Gibbs sampler or Bayesian sampler or MCMC. You know, we have some states we actually care about. That's what our data is given in. But we may need to add some extra data to keep around to make it feasible to do simulation, right? to do a Gibbs sampler. And this is a similar kind of situation. So let me just try to explain in a second why this works. See, if you start here, I'm going to show you, here's going to be the calculation of calculating the probability to go from a partition to a proposal partition. And the thing we need to keep in mind is what about going backwards, okay? So the first thing we do is we take 
two of the elements in the partition and we fuse them together into a macroscopic clump. That's easy. That's a mini to one map and it's deterministic. Then we draw a new spanning tree on that partition. That's a mini to one, a one to mini map. It's, ra it's random. There are many spanning trees on a given partition. Then we find a way to cut it to keep it balanced. That's a one to few map, cutting the spanning tree into two spanning trees. And then here's the kicker, the one in red. We then throw away those spanning trees and just report the partitions. The problem is that's many to one. So if we now want to invert this map, we have to find all the possible spanning trees that could have produced this partition. And that's very expensive often. Whereas if we just keep track of the trees instead, every one of these maps is relatively easy to invert, okay? And that leads to a huge computational savings, which allows us to actually metropolize this proposal using spanning trees to build partitions, okay? So it sounds like a really trivial adaptation, but it actually allows us to be much more efficient in, in, our, in our proposals and calculate the reverse probabilities inexpensively. All right. <clears throat> all right, how am I doing? All right, I'm doing all right. Okay, so, so that's is just driving this point home. <clears throat> all right, so uh, let me just go on. Okay, so there are two reasons why that wasn't good enough for us. One reason was is that we want to preserve counties. So here's the 100 counties in North Carolina. If you just do this merging and splitting at the precinct level, you have a much harder time preserving counties. Um, and the other reason is actually, to be honest, if you do this at the precinct level or at the much finer level, which is the census level, it's even pretty expensive to do this at the state level, okay, in North Carolina. So we end up coming up with a new idea, which is that we're gonna have a merge, we're gonna do a multi-scale representation. So we're gonna, like we often do in computational science, we're gonna build up a Markov chain Monte Carlo proposal that lives at different scales, okay? So we're gonna first think about doing a merge split algorithm like I talked about on the county level, but you see some of these counties aren't perfectly contained in one district. So we're gonna have these little white dashes that keep track of that. And so it's kind of a, a marked element. And so when we merge two, we're gonna first merge these two, the purple and the green district. And when we do that, we're going to make a spanning tree on the whole thing. Then we're going to cut it into two separate spanning trees. And now we're going to refine down inside this, span, this county. And now we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to put a new spanning tree on this county alone and then find the place to cut it. And so the end result is, is this lower picture here we end up having a multi-scale proposal, okay? And this opens up lots of interesting ideas. You could think about doing deferred acceptance rejection at the different scales. There's, there's a whole bunch of interesting ideas, but the main idea here is that by entering this structure, we can in a way build, it's in a way it's a sequential Monte Carlo building of the proposal for our Markov chain in some ways. It's not exactly true, okay? <clears throat> All right, very good. And this is work in progress. We have a preliminary paper up on the archive already, um, but we're, we only have two scales in our code in that paper. We're now work finishing the code to do three scales. We'll actually do N scales, the general problem. It was, we did some cheats to make two scales work quickly. Now we're gonna do three scales and we're gonna, hopefully we expect to be able to sample at the state of North Carolina, which is from census block, which there's about 80,000, maybe after you do some cleaning up, maybe, in the 50,000s of census blocks, <clears throat> and then you know 3,000 precincts, and then 100 counties, and we're gonna we're going to be able to sample across all those scales in an efficient way spatially. All right, so here's the new multi-scale merge split. Split. Here's this kind of multigraph that lives it with different scales, and we have some conditions about how things have to be included. We don't just, we're not looking for all partitions. We're looking for hierarchical partitions that have certain types of inclusion structures. Um, but it turns out that that's enough to get all partitions at the, at the scale we want. So we first merge. So we merge the green 
and the dark gray here to get the light gray. Then we draw a spanning tree at the coarsest scale. Then we cut that in half. And then we refine the scale here. And we partition this. And then we find a place. So it turns out there's a couple red edges we could have cut. We pick one of them and we cut it. And then we end up with the new partition. Right. So part of the idea here is that we don't need to refine the graph at this smallest scale here in the ones that are kept whole. You know, it's like I was going to tell you there's an actual compression that happens here, and we're keeping that compression in our sampling algorithm so that we don't have to spend computational time making decisions about scales that don't matter in counties that we're not going to split. All right, very good. So I think this would be a natural second if there are any questions. I don't see any. Kavita, have there any, any popped up to you? No? no. Okay. All right, very good. Then I will, here's some results. I'll show you, here's some simulations uh, in just flipbook style. I'll just flip through, you know, here's kind of an evolution of this chain as we're moving along. Uh, and uh, if you do 10,000 proposals, you'll see that the two redistrictings look quite different. So at least passes that simple test. Um, here's 15,000 proposals, again, different. So there's been a burn in at the beginning and now we seem to be moving around sampling. And uh, if we do kind of a, uh, a, a kind of standard Metropolis Hastings where we look at a whole bunch of chains. Uh, so I forgot how many we had here, maybe 10. And then we look at some marginal statistics of important we see that these statistics are very simple, similar. And then we, uh, we can actually look at the total variation distance of these marginal statistics across our, our 10 different chains that we're running. And we can look at the worst case and the average case. And we see that these are converging pretty well. The, the total variation is decreasing. This is down to 10 to the minus six. That's a minus sign in there. Um, and what's also interesting, there's some really sophisticated enumeration algorithms that if we reduce to a subset of the state, we can actually precisely enumerate, you know, where we have on the order of 40,000 different redistrictings. We can enumerate it and we, so we have an actual ground truth and we can compare how that works here. Um, uh, right. And uh, let's see, I don't know if I have it here. I, I may have this slide. I forgot if I put it in. One interesting thing that happens is uh, we actually see some interesting facts that if we were actually looked for markup mixing on at the level of the entire chain, that takes much longer to converge than if we actually just look at the mixing at the level of these summary statistics that we care about. Um, okay. Um, historically, in the past, unfortunately, this was very dirty. We had to use simulated annealing instead of actual multi-scale merge split. And we see that the, the simulated annealing in the end actually wasn't doing such a bad job. Um, okay. Uh, still, we, I, 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 I lied to you slightly. If you remember, I had this gamma parameter that moved me between uniform sampling on partitions and uniform sampling on spanning trees. We're actually not able to do uniform sampling on partitions at the scale of our entire state. But um, we have run chains at a number of different temperatures, a number of different gamma parameters. We're actually, it's, it's not quite just gamma, it's moving through temperature and gamma space two different parameters simultaneously. We're taking a curve through that space to do our annealing. To do, and we're thinking about, we want to next do parallel tempering. And this is a case study to see that we seem to have overlap of our distributions as we move across our tempering param parameters. Um, so we're hopeful that we'll be able to do some tempering. Um, and it actually also shows, I should mention for those of you who are thinking about this, some people have proposed just using forest number of trees as a measure of compactness, because as things become less and less compact, they have less and less spanning trees, but it turns out to not be exactly comparable. And it's not, it's not, that's what these plots over here show, but I don't really want to spend time um, unpacking that. So I have a little bit of time left and I have a couple topics left. So let me just mention now that another idea is to replace Metropolis Hastings completely. So to move to a non-reversible Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler, so, you know, this is the idea. This goes back to at least, you know, in the physics community for a while, but uh, I think in the physics community, uh, papers by Neil and Holmes and Diakonis. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, if you were just doing this simple random walk on the left, 
We have diffusive behavior. It takes about n squared steps to kind of visit every node typically. If it's ballistic, of course, it takes only n steps to go all the way around. Of course, you have to know a lot about the chain to get that right. You should be so lucky. But the idea of lifting that was in these papers was to say, we're going to create a mixture. We're going to add essentially discrete momentum. And we're going to sometimes be in a plus copy of the state where we only go in one direction. And sometimes we're going to be in a minus, minus copy of our state space where we go in the other direction. All right. <clears throat> and so we're going to replace rejection in our MCMC scheme with flipping of this momentum, which copy of the state space we're on. And so what we've done is there's a now, an, uh, uh, this is not a perfect method yet, but it's interesting. We're trying to develop it. We have a couple different versions of this, maybe the most easy to understand. Well, let me explain both of them. We have two different non-reversible Markov chains in this context. One is center of mass, where we put some vector field flow on the state. This is the analogy of mixing your, right? None of us stir our coffee or our tea, if you're British. Uh, by waiting for it to just diffuse, right? We take our spoon and we stir it. So maybe we want to stir the state. So here's a stirring vector field. And when, when we're in the positive state, we're only going to allow moves that change the center of mass in each district in the direction of this vector field. Okay. And then when we're in the negative state, we'll allow the reverse stirring. Or the district to district, we're going to say, you know, for each pair of districts, we're going to have a momentum. And we're going to decide whether we flow between those two districts in one direction or in the other direction. And that will set up eddies that will flow between them. Okay. <clears throat> so here's a simple example. So let's say we make a chain here. We do a little spin flip and we flip this one over into this one. And that makes a motion in the green direction. And that has a positive projection onto this swirling vector field. And that has, makes this one move in this direction, which also has a positive one. So that would be an allowable move in this chain, okay? And so here's a simple example where we have two states and I have that swirling flow like this. So this first one is just simple spin flip Monte Carlo. This one is using some tempering. And this one is using um, our non-reversible Markov chain. And the thing to know is that to cross the boundary of being at the diagonal, there's a huge entropic barrier because there's a lot of states there. And it's hard to flip it over. So this is a bit of an artificial example. But the thing to notice is that the one on the right will eventually flip over. That is to say, the dark vertices will end up on the bottom. And the plot on the bottom, this is the center of mass one. There it goes. Here is the single node flip in the big thick band. And notice tempering actually does a good bit of help just to get past this. So tempering can also help a lot. All right, and here we flipped over. Okay, very good, very nice. Okay, um, <clears throat> we did some similar tests in that model where after 25,000 steps, you notice that the single node flip hasn't mixed much. This is kind of uh, whether, we're, whether a vertex is in the dark district or the light district. We started in a vertical configuration here. Uh, the center of mass did a much better chance. Of course, after 10 to the seventh steps, they're all pretty good. Um, and here's just measuring transitions between these kind of states. This is, you know, having if when we're typically when we're in something close to this state, how often do we then transition to something like this? And the blue is the center of mass and you see it, it wastes a lot less proposals. It actually does a lot more transitions between them. All right. Okay, <clears throat> I should warn you, you know, this was a toy example. We're now working on more sophisticated examples and it's not so clear cut. Uh, so this, this has some promise, but I would not uh, sell it to the government yet as the way to do it. We're working on it still. Um, so to do this, uh, we had to extend a little bit the idea of uh, the skew detail balance that was then developed for these type of procedures because we're going to take our phase space, the number of partitions. We're going to actually set a whole bunch of momentums. So depending on which kind of setting and if we're in the district to district flow, we actually have a momentum so we have two to the k momentums, right? Uh, uh, no, sorry. We have k choose two momentum, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, k choose, n choose k, n choose two momentums. I can't seem to speak today. Um, and we ha end up having some skewed detail balance with some an involution with just is spinning these different flips. 
So I don't, I'm running out of time, so I don't want to spend too much more time on that. But there is some structure, which is we, we extended the structure that are exists in the literature to allow for multiple momentums and some type of skewed detail balance, which is essentially separating out the detail balance that we're used to to prove Metropolis Hastings actually has the right target into this skew version. And if you do that, so what you do is you propose a state, you draw that state from the chain that respects that momentum. You then check the reversal probability. If it's accepted, the acceptance probability, if it's accepted, you make the move. If not, you flip the momentum because it's not bad. So one of the nice things here is you, in some sense it's kind of technically rejection free because you never waste a step. All right, so, all right, so, uh, What's nice about this is we can actually talk about our system and say like, okay, I explained to you that the, the maps that our government produced were horrible, but even if you made fair maps, they wouldn't be proportional representation because proportional representation would actually follow this black line on exact the peaks of these distributions would be right along this black line. And so, you know, we shouldn't use arguments that need proportional representation to evaluate whether district things are good. It's just a feature of our structure that it's, this doesn't give proportional representation in the United States. All right, um, there, we can do lots of things. There's lots of visualizations. You know, once you have a distribution of outcomes, you can start pulling it apart and really make detailed representations. I won't go into these. These are some plots we showed the court, which gives some more information. Um, all right, so uh, let's just skip ahead. You can actually start doing localized measures. You can start saying like, what parts of the state are actually being damaged by your illegal redistrictings. So we have ways of doing that. Um, and we can represent in these yellow blocks what parts of the state were being politically damaged by the redistrictings. And not surprisingly, they were sections that were basically the other parties, parts of the state. OK? Um, <clears throat> all right. There's some really beautiful enumeration work um, around Keizuke and his collaborators in Japan. Uh, and uh, so there's really some really interesting mathematics around being able to enumerate at this scale. Um, and we've done a number of states, but one last thing I'll say is there's also some interesting work which uh, was started by uh, Maria Allen Fries and, uh, and Wes Pegden, and then a later generalization of this I joined. Um, and maybe this will be, I see the question I'll answer it at the end, uh, that this is an interesting idea about about what can you do if you don't assume Markov chain Monte Carlo mixing, if you don't assume mixing. And the idea builds on the following kind of outlier test. You begin from the district you want to evaluate, you run some type of reversible Markov chain, and but you maybe only are getting local samples, but you ask even locally, what is the chance that a district that you showed me is even the worst district locally? And it turns out there's this idea, uh, Vezage Clifford, serial test that you can use. And so you can actually say that if you start, so what, what you do is you produce a chain Y that starts from the districting you want to analyze. And you start a chain Z, which is a reverse chain going backwards. And then you can ask, what's the probability that for some, so omega is some observable, some statistics, some real function. What's the chance that this is unusual in this trajectory that I saw of length K? You can actually set it up by making some choices in K, so the probability of that is, is less than epsilon. So then you can actually report without, and this has no assumption about mixing. And then what we did was we showed how to take this and by running multiple Markov chains, starting from a state, you can glue them together and get a power. So if you have M chains, you can actually end up getting, I'm not gonna explain what the alpha is here, but you can get a power factor here so you can get epsilon to a power. So you can reach, so you know you can increase the power of this by doing multiple runs in parallel on different machines and then combining this. Um, and so that's a really interesting idea to think about here because it, it doesn't assume more any kind of mixing results. All right, so uh, let's see what was the question. Let me just skip to the end. I didn't want to show this. So let me. What was the question here? So the uh, question is, how do you arrive at a final recommendation in terms of map partition? Okay, so we don't give them an answer in terms of, so there's two ways to interpret your question. One way, what you might've been asking is, do I then make a map and say, use this one? I don't do that. I try to produce ways to evaluate, because to be honest, you know, the mathematics can only encode certain ideas. 
But there's a lot, that's why we have representatives, because there's a lot of political decisions that have to be made that aren't encoded in the law specifically, right? That's why we have politicians do this, if assuming they act in good faith. Um, what we do do is we show how unlikely it would have been to have someone draw such a map if they drew from a map from a distribution that only had those characteristics that the law prescribed. So if they claim that they use no other influence in their decision making, we can say that seems highly unlikely. Because if you did, you would have, it would have been extremely unlikely. Like, you know, I looked at 100,000 maps, and I never saw a map that had the properties of your map. Then it starts I to say, like, I think, I think you went looking for your map. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Kamita. No, 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 I think that answers the next question also, which says, so at least we will know if the given districting is really biased. Right. And I think this is an idea, right? So it is a more general framework. You have some problem. And instead of saying like, oh, I'm going to make some abstract idea of what fairness is. Let's just take the rules that you gave. Let's apply them in a way that we know is not biased. Let's see what the distribution of outcomes we get is. And then let's compare your result to that. It may be that the rules create a bias and then we should change the rules. But if the rules created this much of a bias, and then yours is much more biased, then I start to think that you did something on purpose, right? And that's how the argument goes legally. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in interesting applied problems lead to interesting mathematics. And I also believe the other, that interesting mathematics will eventually find interesting applications. But talking about the arrow in one direction, I'll just do a small ad for this if you're interested. There's a huge amount of variation uh, work right now. There's some interesting ideas about, about geometry in this setting. Um, although geometry is not enough to really solve the problem. Some people thought that, but it isn't. Um, we've done some work on, uh, on sequential Monte Carlo and uh, KZUK did some work on sequential Monte Carlo. We've done some work on parallel tempering and simulated tempering and trying to use those ideas here. Um, there's also ideas about even how do you visualize this very high dimensional phase space and understand the structure of voting. So we're trying to use some, do some work there. There's some interesting topological data analysis that, uh, that, 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 that Thomas and Moon and some other people have done. There's uh, also some stuff around optimal transport that people have done. Uh, we've been doing some PCA to understand uh, kind of diffusion wavelet ideas to understand the structure of the space space. Um, there's ideas about trying to come up with a you know, simple I showed you some plots, which I didn't really explain. They have these nice little histograms like this that I said, these were the sufficient statistics we cared about. Um, here's a, we, you could make a simple Ising model. Here's a random Fourier series to distribute the people on the state of North Carolina. And then you could ask, what's the distribution that comes from that? Could you make some theory about why you get this distribution? So far, we don't understand it. These plots are made with MATLAB. Um, there's the stuff that I talked about with Wes. Uh, there's also uh, people using very sophisticated enumeration. These enumerations are actually making their ways into court cases as validations to present to the court. Like we tested this in a small scale in the actual setting and it worked well. Now we, we're gonna give you the same evaluation for the statewide and, uh, you know, and lots of political papers and lots of people coming up with ideas to detect. And these are all mathematicians, everything I'm showing you. So, and you know, things like save democracy. <laughs> so lots to do. And I'll just say the last thing I'll say is uh, maybe the way I got into this was a very smart undergraduate student who is now a very smart PhD recent recipient from the Applied and Computational Math program at Princeton, Christy Vaughn, Christy Graves now, she's, she's married. And, um, but uh, all these students who worked on this, they, most of them have UG next to their name. That means they were undergraduates when they did this work. And so this is a great place to uh, involve undergraduates in interesting problems that teach them a lot of mathematics and actually can eventually have an impact. Um, so, you know, this is a huge number of undergraduates that worked on this. And then I have some collaborators from the, from the data science and law and mathematics community. And uh, I've gotten money, uh, not surprisingly, not from federal funding sources, but from uh, various foundations and my university to do this work. So thank you very much. And if you want more, there's a blog that we write called uh, Quantifying Gerrymandering that has a lot of short little descriptions of our work 
and interesting conversational pieces. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I guess since I'm the last speaker, normally we would all stand up and say, thank you so much to the organizers for putting this together. Um, I wish we could have all been there to get together and meet, talk to some of these wonderful speakers and meet all the people at the uh, Institute in, in Mumbai, but uh, it didn't work out that way. But um, thank you very much for putting together a really scientifically stimulating week. So thanks a lot for me at least. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you very much for the talk. And let me echo that I too would have really loved to be actually able to meet everybody, though this would have been in Bangalore. Oh, Bangalore, uh, I'm sorry. I just... But uh, just one question, um, is it possible to apply this method to assess the fairness of the electoral college as well? I know you've said very clearly, we're not trying to do that. We're just trying to yeah. see. Well, I mean, I guess, so here's the question, right? What do you mean by fairness of the electoral college? If you meant, does it produce proportional representation? We already know that, that it doesn't, right? Uh, yeah, but maybe the know, degree of, is there a way to measure the degree of unfairness of that or something? Yeah, like yeah. There is, I mean, if fairness meant proportional representation, right? And my perspective on fairness is that I'm not going to take that as my meaning of fairness. I'm kind of saying like, you give me your algorithm. You pretend that you just use this algorithm with no other external constraints or no external influence. I'm going to look and see what the algorithm produces, which we can have a separate conversation about whether that algorithm is fair. But then I'm going to decide whether you actually did what you said. Because you can, of course, under the table, go back in your closet and look at the results of your algorithm and go, oh, yeah, I'm going to pick this one because I like it better for reasons which you're not telling anyone, right? And that's what happened historically. Um, but what we can do, Kavita, is we can, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm sorry, but if it, we did, if we wanted fairness, you know, Rhode Island shouldn't have two senators. So this was a question by Sina Sajadi. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> and certainly not Wyoming, right? Wyoming is a state of eighty thousand people, and it has two senators. And you know, my city has almost my, you know, where I grew up has more people than that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's that you, you have to talk about fairness, subject to my, yeah. you know, some minority constraints, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so, yeah. so if we talk about that, I mean, so that's the definition it. of that whole thing, right? Right, Which so is, if, if, yeah. if, you know, if, if you ask the following instead, if we made some other representation that weren't based on the state, so one thing that would be interesting to say is let's reshuffle the state lines in a different way. Would that, and still keep some small states and big states, is how is our current states, how does that advantage or disadvantage minority groups? You could answer questions like that, very much so. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Jonathan, of course, we asked many during the talk as well. Okay. Um, I've asked him plenty of questions on this topic. Okay, so there's there's a big thank you from you and from everybody uh, um, in this thing, and thanks to all the speakers of this session and also for the of the conference. And thank you so much, Jonathan, for taking the time to give a give a talk, and to uh, Natesh and to Gareth. Thank you very much.